Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your time. My name is Vic Vignola, and tonight I'm going to be presenting to you uh, my book called The Contrasts and Command, The Battle of Fair Oaks. Uh, primarily, it's about the Battle of Seven Pines and Fair Oaks, um, but for most students of the Civil War, all they know of Seven Pines is, is that's the battle where Joseph Johnston was wounded, and then uh, subsequent to that, Robert E. Lee was appointed into command of Confederate armies, and for many people, that's where their study of the Eastern Theater then begins. But as you'll see tonight, uh, as I talk to you about the fighting that occurred in Fair Oaks, there was contrast in command between the federal leadership and the uh, Confederate leadership. And you will hopefully agree with me by the end of the day that Edwin Bowes Bull Sumner had his most two glorious days as a commander in the Army of the Potomac there at Fair Oaks. So the Battle of Seven Pines or Fair Oaks, which is it? Well, according to Joseph E. Johnston, the Battle of Seven Pines or Fair Oaks, as Northern people prefer to call it, no action of the war has been so little understood as that of Seven Pines. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the primary culprit as to why this battle is so little understood is none other than Joseph E. Johnston. Bull Sumner was testifying before the Joint Committee for the Conduct of the Civil War when a panelist said to him, General, the Battle of Fair Oaks or Seven Pines. They are the same thing under those two names, as I understand. And Sumner bristled and said, oh, no, sir. They are two distinct places. The battle which I commanded on Saturday and Sunday was at Fair Oaks. The Battle of Seven Pines was a separate battle, and General Heintzelman commanded there. Well, it wasn't two separate battles, but there two were two different or separate sectors, the Seven Pines sector and the Fair Oaks sector, and we'll explore them as we go through. So the battle occurred on the outskirts of the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia, and there you can see flowing diagonally across it is the Chickahominy River, which will be a major uh, part of our story tonight. And uh, actually our story begins with the uh, beginning of the Peninsula Campaign by George B. McClellan in early April of 1862, as he advanced the Army of Potomac with the goal of going on to Richmond to capture the Confederate capital and then thereby end the Civil War. He first placed uh, Yorktown under siege, and then by May 5th, there was the Battle of Williamsburg, and shortly after that, Johnston decided it was no longer feasible for him to operate with the Chickahominy River to his rear. He'd rather use it as a barrier between him and uh, McClellan's forces, so he crossed his army across this river on May the 18th. McClellan made the decision on May the 20th to follow, and he sent Rasmus Key's Fourth Corps across here at the Bottoms Bridge, and Key's Corps moved out to his position here known as Seven Pines. And Seven Pines sits at the intersection of the Williamsburg Road and the Nine Mile Road, a strategic position. Two days after Key's crossed, the Third Corps also crossed here, so there was two corps across the river by May the 23rd. So this is the position of the armies, and I'll break this slide down for you now. McClellan had five corps, 102,000 men in his army. Fitz John Porter was positioned here at Mechanicsville, actually at the Beaver Dam Creek, which would be the scene of the battle on June 26, when Lee begins his Seven Days campaign. William Franklin's Sixth Corps is here opposite Newbridge, which is the primary and most important crossing of the Chickahominy River. Then if you jump down across and look at Keyes' position, Keyes has two uh, divisions in his command, Silas Casey and Darius Couch. Now the entire command of the Fourth Corps, uh, to explain it best, Casey's division had 13 regiments in it, but of the 13 regiments, eight of them were brand new. They had just boarded, basically arrived in Washington, D.C., were placed on ships, sent to the uh, beginning of the Peninsula Campaign and advanced throughout the campaign to this position. Keyes often wrote that his division was the most poorly trained, poorly officered, and poorly led, yet here they were in the most advanced position for the Army of the Potomac. Couch's division, uh, I'm sorry, Casey had approximately 5,500 men in his division uh, due to much illness that was rampant in the division at the time. Couch's division, 7,500 men, was to the rear and flank of Casey's division. Then there was a two-mile gap back here to Heintzelman's Third Corps, 
And as you can see, there's Carney's division as well as Joe Hooker down here at White Oak Swamp. Sumner's division was placed in this position on May the 25th by uh, McClellan. And he gave Sumner three, three tasks to perform. The first one would be to protect the supply line, which is off of this map up at White House Landing. The second role that Sumner was to fulfill, should Porter and Franklin be attacked, it was Sumner's duty to support them on their flanks. His third and primary role would be if Keyes were to be attacked, it was Sumner's duty to support Keyes. However, on May the 25th, there was no bridges located on the Chickahominy, so Sumner would have to travel all the way down to Bottoms Bridge and out along the Williamsburg Road. It's a distance of well over 10 miles. Sumner decided he would cut that distance down to about three miles by building bridges. So on May the 26th, he ordered two colonels to come to his office to select them to build bridges, one for Josh, uh, John Sedgwick's division and the other for Israel Richardson's division. And construction actually began on May the 27th. Now, this photo you see in front of you is the Library of Congress photo. Uh, it's called the, the Grapevine Bridge. But before I get into talking about the Great Vine Bridge, let's talk about the Chickahominy River. The Chickahominy is a river is a pretty, uh, for lack of a better term, it's never a river you're going to hear of uh, schools of music, poetry, or art writing about this river. It's a slow-moving, brackish water uh, river. But most most of the river flows through a belt of heavily timbered swamps. Uh, it's it's infested with mosquitoes snakes, and a lot of undergrowth. And if I told you that the Great Vine Bridge was 1,200 feet long, you would think, wow, that's long for a bridge. Well, 1,100 feet of the 1,200 feet was actually causeway. So what you're seeing in this photo is actually a portion of the causeway. And what Cross did when he had his men construct this bridge uh, or this causeway, they would cut down the trees so that the stumps were of, of approximately even height. And then the uh, logs were then laid across the, the decking to support uh, the, the uh, crossing of the troops across. Sumner's only requirement was that the bridge be uh, sturdy enough to get across the swamps and also strong enough to support artillery so that should he need it, that's what he would do. And as you can see from this uh, note here, it says not a pin, dowel, bolt, or nail entered into its construction. The men that constructed it said they used ropes and the plentiful grapevines in the area to give it a flexibility, which will be tested, uh, as we will soon see. Now you move to the Confederate side of the equation, and here you can see all the Confederate forces assembled. Now, um, Johnston had an army of 53,000 men, but Robert E. Lee, who had been the primary military advisor to Jefferson Davis, had summoned together reinforcements from throughout the city, so that by the time this battle is about to begin, there were 88,000 Confederate soldiers in and around the city of Richmond. What you see pictured on this map is approximately 70,000 of those 88,000 men. So how did we get to the fighting that occurs on May 31st? Well, it actually starts with a plan that Johnston has to launch an attack for May the 29th. And leading that attack would be Gustavus Woodson Smith and A.P. Hill. They would cross at Meadow Bridge and strike Porter on his front and flank at Beaver Dam Creek. It's essentially the same plan that Lee is going to follow later that June. However, on May the 28th, there's a council of war held in Johnston's headquarters. And it is during this council of war that Smith, who has now reconnoitered the position, demons that... Uh, de denotes that Porter's position is a very strong one. And even though it can be taken, it's going to be a very bloody and costly fight. And it's not sure that the military benefit is there. And he talks Johnston out of making the attack altogether. So Johnston calls off the attack, which infuriates James Longstreet. Longstreet then pulls Johnston aside later that evening and explains to him how if he, Longstreet, had been in charge, he would have carried off the attack. It would have been successful to the cause. It would have brought glory to both Johnston and to Longstreet. Um, Longstreet, uh, Johnston, I'm sorry, says to Longstreet, it appears as though I appointed the wrong officer to lead this advance. 
So nonetheless, the 29th comes and goes. There's no attack. However, Daniel Harvey Hill, operating here on the Williamsburg Road, does reconnaissance towards Casey's division, both on the 29th and the 30th, and determines that Casey is vulnerable. He sends back word to Johnston. Johnston determines he's going to make an attack on Keyes' exposed Fourth Corps, and he calls Longstreet to his headquarters, and this is the plan that the two men craft together. During the afternoon of May the 30th, the plan that they devise is that Longstreet will move his six brigades east along the Nine Mile Road to a position here called Old Tavern. That'll place 13,800 men squarely on the right flank of Keyes' Fourth Corps. Smith will also move his division in this uh, area of the Old Tavern, so he will be supporting uh, Longstreet, and then he can also advance as the battle unfolds. Benjamin Yugi will move his division of 6,200 men through the city of Richmond, down here at Charles City Road, placing it on the left flank of Keyes' Fourth Corps. Once Yugi arrives there, uh, by six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, Robert Rhodes will then join D.H. Hill. Hill, upon Rhodes's arrival, will open the attack along the Williamsburg Road, striking Casey in the front. Once the sounds of fighting cascade and begin emanating, Longstreet will then advance down the old, uh, from Old Tavern, down the Nine Mile Road, striking Keyes' Fourth Corps in the flank. Front and flank, approximately 25,000 Confederates striking a combined force of, of the Fourth Corps of around 12,000 to 12,500 men. After they destroy Keyes' Fourth Corps, and hopefully before reinforcements can reach uh, across the river, they will then go on and strike Heinzelman's Third Corps. So that's the plan. And it's pretty simple in its task, and it's going to overwhelm the exposed Fourth Corps and then take on the Third Corps as well. But there's a major flaw in the plan. Johnston and Longstreet have met all afternoon to devise this plan. And Johnston sees that Longstreet is taking notes and participating in developing the plan. Johnston decides it's not necessary for him to issue written orders to Longstreet, which is a fatal flaw to as the plan unfolds. Also, a second event occurs, and it's an event they had no control of. There was a thunderstorm that struck the area the evening of May the 30th. And it's not just any thunderstorm. It was described in some accounts of being a storm of biblical proportions. In other words, the rain fell with great, great speed and, and volume, and the uh, amount of, of thunder and lightning was incredible. Another called it a flood from the sky, flood falling from the sky. And a third account actually came from E.P. Alexander in his military memoirs of the Confederate. He wrote, that as an entire service during the Civil War as a Confederate, he never experienced a storm as intense or as violent as the storm that occurred on May the 30th, 1862. So it is this storm that now affects the entire area. It had rained four of the seven previous days, so all the streams were at flood stage, all the roads were a mess, all the fields were wet, and of course, the Chickahominy River was now in full flood stage. So nonetheless, the storm stops somewhere around midnight, the 30th into 31st, and the soldiers begin unfolding uh, their, their tents and moving into their positions and movements begin. And the attack, which is supposed to begin at eight o'clock in the morning is still now looking like it could occur. However, eight o'clock in the morning comes and Johnston is in his headquarters and he hears no sounds of fighting. And at nine o'clock, he not only knows that there's no sounds of fighting, but now he's receiving word that there's a traffic jam on the Nine Mile Road. And then he has no idea what's going on. All he does know is, is that Longstreet is not where he's supposed to be. Longstreet, for some reason, and he never explained it, never explains why he did not move east along the Nine Mile Road. Instead, he went south towards the Williamsburg Road. And in doing so, he reached a, an important crossing of this flooded Gillies Creek out about 20 minutes before Yugi's division reached it. 
Longstreet then began crossing his entire division across that flooded creek before Hughie could. And despite the fact that Longstreet crafted the plan and knew how important it was for Hughie to meet, uh, to reach Rhodes so that Rhodes could then join Hill and he attacked it again, Longstreet delayed Hughie's crossing by over four hours. Worse, Longstreet has kept Johnston totally in the dark. He has not sent back any word as to his status, his location, his position, or what his progress is at all. And that's a fatal flaw because Johnston is totally in the dark. So where's Longstreet? Johnston had no idea. So much so that he said to a staff officer with him, I wish the troops had remained in their camps. It doesn't sound like an officer who's looking to solve a problem or to, to initiate an, an aggressive plan. That sounds like one that's resigned to his fate. However, same cannot be said for Daniel Harvey Hill. He receives word at 1030 in the morning that Yugi has finally crossed Gillies Creek. So Hill sends a rider down to Rhodes and tells him, don't wait for Yugi. He's on his way. You get up here. And when you do, I'm going to start the attack. And that's precisely what happens. At one o'clock in the afternoon, Rhodes finally arrives and the attack along the Williamsburg Road begins. This is the fighting in the Seven Pines sector of the battle. Hill initially commits three of his brigades and then he sends George Anderson's brigade into the attack. And Casey's men, it's a combination of Casey's men are putting up a decent fight, not a great fight, but they have like an abattee out here that's slowing the advance, the flooded fields, as well as the fact that the, the, the Confederates are also new to this game themselves. So a combination of factors is uh, having Casey's men do a successful defense for at least an hour and a half. It is at this time that Hill decides he receives word that this right flank of the Federals, uh, where it says Nagley, this right flank, between there and the railroad station is exposed and can be exploited. However, Hill does not have enough troops to do it, he sends back word to Longstreet to have him send him a brigade, which, he, which Longstreet does. Richard Anderson's brigade comes up, Hill splits it in two, part of the brigade under Anderson he sends forward along the Williamsburg Road. The other part of the brigade is under Colonel Micah Jenkins, a uh, South Carolinian, 26 years old. Hill meets with Jenkins and explains to him that he wants Jenkins to find the right flank of the Federals and to drive through and cut across the nine mile road, get into the rear, and that'll unhinge the Federal front. At the same time that this meeting is going on between Hill and Jenkins, on the Federal side, Erasmus Keyes meets with Darius Couch, and he also recognizes that there's a vulnerability to the right flank. So Keyes orders Couch to take the 61st Pennsylvania and the 23rd Pennsylvania forward to, to plug that gap. And they arrive at almost at the same time with 1,200 men as Jenkins does with 1,500 men, uh, as well as the support of the 27th Georgia. And in a 20-minute brawl in those woods, Jenkins smacks the 61st Pennsylvania on its flank. He either kills, wounds, or captures all the officers, line officers of the 61st Pennsylvania. They suffered close to 300 casualties of the fi 550 men they brought into the, the fight. The 23rd Pennsylvania is driven off. The 67th New York, which came forward briefly. The 23rd Pennsylvania, 67th New York, do a fighting retreat. Some of the members of the 61st join that fighting retreat. Others, along with Couch, fall back to the place known as Fair Oaks Depot or Fair Oaks Station. But before I continue with the story, notice what Jenkins has done. He has cut across the Union flank, gotten onto the Nine Mile Road, and gone into the rear, causing the Federals to have to fall back from this forward position. It's precisely what he has done with 1,500 men, what Longstreet should have been doing with 13,800 men coming down this nine mile road, striking keys on the flank. Imagine had, had Longstreet followed through with that order and 13,000 men had struck that flank rather than 1,500. Afterwards, Keyes wrote, and this is a quote directly from Erasmus Keyes, my right was on ground 
so favorable to the approach of the enemy and being so far from the Chickahominy that if Johnston had then attacked, I could have made but a feeble defense comparatively and every man of us would have been killed, captured, or driven into the swamps or river for any assistance could have reached us. So the pivotal moment in the battle and a prime lost opportunity for the Confederates. So, oops, went the wrong way, sorry. Now, this is what the situation looks like between 3 o'clock and 3.30 p.m. And I'm gonna break this down for you in three pieces. Couch, when he arrives here at Fair Oaks Station, Fair Oaks Depot, he arrives and sees that there's a brigade there and it's under command of John Abercrombie. There's approximately 2,000 men and four artillery pieces. And Couch, from the sounds of the fighting, knows that he is completely surrounded and completely cut off. He can hear the sounds of fighting to his left and rear, and he knows that he's in trouble. He also knows that two miles up the road, that there must be a large Confederate force here at Old Tavern. And for some reason, they haven't come yet, but he knows they soon will. Couch summons over an officer by the name of Captain William Van Ness. And he tells Van Ness, I want you to ride and ride for your life to those bridges and tell me if Sumner and tell Sumner if he has crossed to get here, I need him as quick as he can get here. So let's go off now and talk about Sumner. Sumner, at one o'clock in the afternoon, when the sounds of fighting began in Seven Pines, those sounds of fighting carried clearly across the river to where he was having dinner at that time with Sedgwick and Richardson. And it is said that the sounds of fighting went directly from Sumner's ears, directly into his heart. And as soon as he heard the volume and intensity of firing, he told Sedgwick and Richardson, both of you, form your divisions now and form them at their bridges and await my orders to cross. It was a crucial decision he made on his own, as it was building the bridges. On his own, he orders them to assemble at the bridges before McClellan has even sent any notice about forming his divisions. Then at 2.30, when McClellan notifies Sumner that he wants him to cross, Sumner has saved well over an hour worth of time by having his men assemble at the bridges and they begin to cross. Well, let's talk about this for a minute. Sedgwick's division is led by Willis Gorman's brigade and leading Willis Gorman's brigade is the 1st Minnesota, a very famous regiment, as we know, veterans of the uh, first Battle of Manassas, although at the time it was the only Battle of Manassas. And these young men are standing on the banks of a flooded river and looking across a flooded uh, causeway, and they can see it moving back and forth and up and down. And many of these young fellows can't swim, and they're ordered now to cross it, and they begin to go across. And one of those, uh, it was described by an engineer that the flexibility by constructing the bridge out of grapevines and ropes had given it enough flexibility that when the floodwaters rose and crashed into it, it actually lifted the bridge up. And as the men began walking across it, it settled it down onto those piers and the men were able to get all the way across the bridge. It's quite a remarkable story. But when they got to the other store side on the Southern bank, of course, the men getting across and their horses getting across chewed up the ground and made the mud into a muck and slur it. And then when a battery uh, called the first, uh, first U.S. under command of, of Lieutenant uh, Edmund Ned Kirby was his name, his six guns come across the causeway and the bridge. And when they get to the other side, all the horses sank up to their girths uh, from all the mud and the muck that was there. Kirby ordered his men to unharness the horses. The rest of the men from uh, Gorman's brigade stacked their guns, and together they attached prolong ropes to the trails of the guns. They pulled the horses through, and with uh, prolong ropes attracted to the trails of the guns, other men got into the mud and muck. Some are turning the wheels, others are lifting the barrels and sliding them through. They got each of the six guns through the mud and muck reharnessed their horses and off they went to assist Couch. And we'll get there in a little bit, but that's a quite a remarkable story of how they crossed the Chickahominy and it was sheer determination, muscle 
and the fact that they knew that their brothers in arms were in trouble, they had to get there and they did. Now let's go up here to where Johnston is. Johnston has moved his headquarters to a small farmhouse uh, just outside of Old Tavern and Smith's division is there. Uh, however, Smith is not commanding the division that day. He has given command of the division to a young fellow by the name of William H.C. Chase White. Uh, Whiting is in command of the division, even though Smith is physically present. Uh, the division has approximately 11,200 men under its command. And even though the same sounds of fighting that carried so easily northeast across the river, so Sumner could hear them, those very sounds of fighting did not travel north three miles. They, the same sounds of fighting could not be heard at Old Tavern. It's an anomaly. It's called an acoustic shadow, but no one knew the fighting was going on between one o'clock and when a note arrived from Longstreet at four o'clock informing Johnston that he is driving the enemy back and that he can drive them in the Chickahominy River by nightfall if he were to receive support on his left flank. Well, that's all Johnston had to hear. He now is enthusiastic that he can move down this road and he can smash the uh, keys his fourth corps and win the day and still have a victory. So he tells Whiting, form the division, let's move, but the roads are too muddy and it's going to be too hard to move our artillery. Leave the artillery here until we move the men out. We'll have the artillery follow us. And that's going to be another crucial mistake that, that Johnston makes in this battle. So you see these four dots here? These four dots denote Two, picket, uh, two companies on picket duty from the 61st Pennsylvania. These young fellows were very fortunate they weren't in the woods that got steamrolled by, by Jenkins' men. These two companies are under command of a young captain by the name of Robert Orr. And if you're a hockey fan, the name Robert Orr, number four, Bobby Orr, the Boston Bruins, not that one. This Robert Orr would later earn a Medal of Honor April 2nd, 1865, when he was in command of the 61st Pennsylvania at the breakthrough in Petersburg. Or realizes that as he sees this large force coming down the road towards him, that he must get back and inform Couch and Abercrombie that they'll soon be having visitors. So he begins his movement back towards Couch. Now let's go back to Couch and Abercrombie. All this time that I'm explaining to you, each one of these separately, they're all going on simultaneously. Couch and Abercrombie, have to make a decision. Their decision, they cannot stay here and fight because they'll easily be outflanked and they'll be driven off in, in a heartbeat and they'll, they'll just cause much death and mayhem uh, to this small brigade. The couch has already determined that he can't fight his way back through these lines because the Confederate lines just are, are too strong for him to even begin to figure out where uh, Kearney's division has come up to in support. He's not going to fall back, but he does realize a half mile away up near near where it says the Adams house, there's a small ridge line here. It's a slight eminence. And him and Abercrombie decide we're going to move to that slight eminence. As they're deciding they're going to move to that slight eminence, here comes Robert Orr informing them that the Confederates are behind them. And off the Abercrombie and Couch move that small brigade up that slight road. And here's a picture of it today. This is a present day view of it. The railroad depot is back here in these trees. And this is that slight eminence. You'll see another view of it coming the other way in a few minutes. But it was along this road here that some of the artillery pieces were set up. And this is a photograph from the 34th New York Regimental History depicting that they were lined up in this field over here to the left. And that they misnamed it the Williamsburg Road. But this is essentially the same road today. In Sandston, Virginia, this is called the Hanover Road. At the time of the battle, it didn't have a name. I call it the Grapevine Bridge Road. So now we move on. So what I'm about to explain to you now, I'm going to give to you one piece at a time, but please realize all of what I'm about to describe to you is happening simultaneously. It's all going to be, it's very dynamic as what's going on here. As Johnson moves down the nine mile road, 
Longstreet's note didn't specify where his left flank was or where he could, he could use assistance. So Johnston blindly detaches John Bell Hood's Texas Brigade off to the right of the Nine Mile Road and tells Hood, you find Johnston's left, or you find Longstreet's left, and once you tell me where it is, I'll bring the rest of the division there. Leading the way for the rest of the, of the division is the 6th North Carolina, being commanded this day by Colonel William Dorsey Pender. Pender is leading uh, Evander Law's brigade. Johnston and Whiting are riding on their horses with Law's brigade. Following them is J. Johnston Pettigrew's brigade. Uh, Gustavus Woodson Smith is behind that, and he is in front of Wade Hampton's brigade as well as Robert Hatton's brigade. They're moving down this road. And as they're moving down this road, Whiting, even though he's in command of the division, seated alongside of him is the commander of the army, and a half mile behind him is the true commander of the division. So you ask yourself, how much authority really did Whiting have? Especially when he notices this movement that's going on on this road and off to his flank, he's getting nervous that there appears as though there's soldiers on his left flank and rear. So he, he sends forward a rider to tell Pender and Law to stop, to advance no further until he can figure out what's going on with the situation. Johnston chides him for doing that. And then out here, the rider makes it to Law and Law stops. But Pender's men don't, he doesn't make it out to where Pender's 6th North Carolina is. And it's in this field here, just on the other side of the railroad tracks, Lieutenant Alfonso Avery of the 6th North Carolina sees all these flags and sees all these men forming. And he calls out to Pender, Colonel, there's Yankees on our left. And with that, Pender says, by the right flank, charge bayonets. And we're about to have the fighting begin in the sector of Fair Oaks. But before we get to that, let's talk about Couch. Couch, he moves up this road as the Confederates are moving down this road. And as he moves into this position, he knows he does not have enough men to hold this position as it is. Yes, he will be able to control anyone trying to cross this road, but if he's directly attacked and on his flank, he will not have enough men to hold the position. As he's determining how to deploy and, and what to deploy, here comes Van Ness riding back on his lathered up horse, saying, General, Sumner has crossed the river and he will soon be here with us. And it's almost like if someone from Hollywood had written the script, Couch then looks out across the field and sees Sumner and Gorman riding on their horses across the field. And here's the men from the first Minnesota running with the double quick through the mud and the muck to reach their position. Couch later wrote in his report, he wrote, I knew then that God was with us and victory would soon be ours. And with that, these men began forming into a position that's a defensive position to resist the Confederate attack. So as Pender forms his men to attack in his field, Law, when he sees Pender form into a battle line, he forms his brigade into a line and they each advance up this road to strike what they believe is just a small force there that they can easily brush aside. And as they are attacking across this field, Gorman's men are actively arriving. Kirby's guns are full throttle through these fields trying to reach this position. So the deployment and the attack is going on simultaneously. The first Minnesota, as they arrive, they ask uh, Couch, where do you want me to go? Couch says, go out to my right flank. It is that dynamic, folks, as the fighting is coming along. And what happens is, is this is what it looks like for the Confederates coming up this slight eminence. The Federal position would have been here. There would have been artillery guns placed here. Abercrombie soldiers would have been in a tree line or on the left of this road. And on the right of this line, there would have been some forming of troops as well. Pender's men would have been coming in from the right side of this photo. Law's men would have been coming in on the left side, and they would have all been going for, this, for the guns, because really at that time, this is all they could see was the actual guns. Here's a couple of accounts for you. Pender wrote, as we advanced, the fire of the battery was so unexpected and so severe 
that my right soon broke and I couldn't rally. Another from uh, Private uh, William Themster from the Second Mississippi from Law's Brigade uh, wrote of this opening attack. He says, "We they immediately opened a heavy and destructive fire on us from their batteries. And then he added, we had no artillery with which to engage them. Remember, Johnston left his artillery behind. His men are advancing into positions that are defended by artillery. He had none with which to resist. So the Confederates fell back. This initial, this initial surge, I call it an advance, but this initial surge is, is really a quick one. They brush up, they're, they're, they receive heavy fire, they fall back, they reform, and as someone, and no one knows who, someone gives the order to begin the advance again. And now the Confederates resume their attack. And this is the second advance in the, the Fair Oaks sector. And in the second advance, Law's Brigade, Pettigrew's Brigade, and uh, Wade Hampton's Brigade all move forward. Approximately 7,500 men are now engaged in the second advance. But before we get to talking about the second advance, there's something that needs to be explained about this terrain. The road on the right, this Grapevine Bridge Road, is bordered by a large worm fence on either side, which basically uh, provides like a flanking uh, barrier for the advancing soldiers. So this worm fence is, is a barrier on the right. On the left, you notice this stream that comes long into this area here. Remember, flood that fell from the sky, the most violent storm that E.P. Alexander ever experienced in the Civil War. It flooded the Chickahominy, and it also flooded this nameless stream. And when it did so, it shaped the battlefield. So much so that accounts call it as a, a swamp. Another account said it was my like our column moved across a lagoon and on the edge of a dense wood. That was written by Captain James Bell of the 19th Georgia from Hampton's Brigade, present day. This is what that nameless stream looks like. It flows into a culvert. It goes into a cul-de-sac of a large housing development. But as you can see from this historic map, that stream flowed right into the battlefield. And the effect it had was astounding. The Confederate battle line, 7,500 men, Three brigades are compressed into a battle line 400 yards wide, and they are advancing through muck and mush up a slight eminence, and this wooded line that's defended here is going to be formidable for them to try to take. When the first Minnesota arrived in their position, Colonel Alfred Sully realized that he couldn't be flanked because of that flooded lagoon. So he had three of his companies face front, and he swung seven of his companies down to the right so that they would provide enfilade fire down the road. Sumner, when he arrived, realized Kirby's guns were here and that more guns would soon be arriving. He dispatched two guns under James Brady off to the right so that he would have artillery on the right side of his line. Abercrombie de deployed partially of his brigade on this line. It was like a wooded line that had fence posts, logs, and the men just piled it up as quick as they could between the first advance and the second advance, and that was their position. As Kirby's guns arrived, three of them arrived first. Three more were still en route from being uh, taken out of the mud by the river. He now had five guns on his left, and when the 82nd New York and 34th New York, as they arrived, he swung them down to his left flank. So Sumner, he never says it as such. What he has done is he has created an inverted salient. It's an up to, upside down U or an upside down bracket, but all of the gunfire and all the artillery fire is concentrated on the Confederates who must advance in this 400 yard wide funnel that's flanked on one side by a road with a fence and on the other side by a flooded stream. It was a massive, massive difference for the Confederates, and so much so. Here's some of the accounts that the Confederates had at this time. One account says, the enemy were in rifle pits and their fire appeared to come up out of the ground in one continuous stream. Their fire was not in successive cracks, 
and neither would the usual term used by historians, the role of musketry apply. No, sir. The sound was one continuous roar that lasted for more than half an hour. Another account from Hampton's Legion uh, states that the Yankees presented the appearance of a living wall of flame from the great number and rapidity of their discharges. Finally, one of the best quotes uh, for the whole battle. B.F. Moody, he was a private in the 35th Georgia in Pettigrew's Brigade. He wrote to his wife on June the 2nd. He wrote to her, I have hived bees, but they weren't nearly half as thick as the balls that were flying through the air. It was an intense moment for the Confederates in this first advance rushing forward. And as they're moving forward, it is during this time that Pettigrew is wounded. He receives a wound that goes through his neck and shoulder area, and he believes the wound to be mortal. And he tells the men, leave me on the field, and I'm going to die anyway. He is, he is captured that evening, and he is taken to the Adams house, where he will spend two nights in the Adams house recuperating before he is sent across to uh, Dr. Gaines's position across the river. And here's just some of the faces. Wade Hampton, at some point in this battle, he's also struck in the ankle, and his adjutant, uh, Theodore Barker sees blood coming out of his shoe. This is seven weeks after Albert Sidney Johnston had the same experience, but his was arterial blood and he died. Hampton also was wounded at some point in this battle. There's a picture of Pettigrew in my book. Uh, this is my Irishman, Andrew Byrne. Some of his accounts are really vibrant. And Colonel Alfred Sully had his best day as a commander here at this army as well. So now, Gustavus Smith, who's back here a half mile away, is observing all this carnage going on in front of him. And he sees his division is getting chewed up. And he can also see that there's no leadership and there's no support, and that somebody must go forward to take command and, and assess the situation. So he gathers the 22nd North Carolina, which was in reserve, and Robert Hatton's brigade, and he moves them forward. He meets on the edge of the woods with Hampton, and the two of them decide that the best line of attack is to go right towards the apex of where the federal guns are to try to drive through that wedge and separate the Union line there. That'll be their best chance for victory. However, by now, it is beginning to get, it's well after six o'clock, shadows are forming on the field, and it is starting to get a little bit dark. Uh, John Bell wrote, the condition of the air was such that the smoke of the battle settled low over the field, and I could only see the blaze of guns and the flashes of rifles. Another wrote, the, the light of the evening is lurid with the blaze from the hostile guns. The multitudinous of the messengers of death were thicker than raindrops in a tropical storm. And finally, Theodore Barker from Hampton's brigade wrote, of the Confederates uh, facing artillery fire and musketry, he writes, a most murderous fire of grape, canister and musketry opened upon us. I cannot pretend to describe it. It was awful, shot and shell mowed through our ranks. Well, seated on his horse in front of the Adams house was the chaplain of the first Minnesota. And his name was Chaplain Edward Neal. And Neil was observing alongside, he's there with Gorman and, and he's there with Sumner and, and others. And he's observing the fighting, 100 yards in front of him. He sees the artillerists and the job they're doing. And he, he was so moved by it, he wrote, the rapidity of the loading and firing of Kirby's guns sounded like the incessant pounding in some great steam boiler shop. And it excited the attention and admiration of General Sumner and all the division command. It is during this advance that the Confederates lose a large amount of their staff officers. Here, during this advance, as they were met by a fearful volley which brought my men to stand, Lieutenant Colonel James Griffin, one of the staff officers or line officers that survived, he write, wrote to his wife that the fire was so terrible. Um, Colonel Champion Davis was killed during the advance. Gustavus Bull of the 35th Georgia was received a mortal wound. He was captured, taken that night to the Adams house where his wounds were treated. However, they were mortal. He
he expired the next day. His personal effects were returned to his family. However, he was buried in one of the massive uh, grave pits and his dis remains were never discovered. Robert Hatton, he was killed during the final advance. He was riding alongside Smith as they were moving the Tennesseans. He had the Tennessee Brigade moving them through the, the fields and, and towards the federal line. And an artillery shell struck his horse in his chest and the horse fell on top of Hatton. He extricated himself from the horse. Smith asked him, are you okay, General? Yes, I am. Let's go forward. And as he moved forward, gunfire struck him in the chest, killing him instantly. Uh, that was one of the telling moments because after that, the Tennesseans pretty much uh, had had it for the day. It was the first major encounter in the war. Colonel John Riker was the only line officer lost on the federal side. Riker uh, commanded the 62nd New York, and if the name Riker sounds familiar to you at all, uh, with Rikers Island Prison, it's an infamous prison in New York City's harbor. Uh, his family had owned it prior, but he was killed as he, his men were resisting the attack on the uh, guns and driving the Confederates away from Kirby's guns and, and the guns that were in front of them. Well, it is during this time that Sumner now notices it's time to go from the defensive to the offensive, and he tells Gorman, order the men forward, and he orders a counterattack. And basically, the whole left side of his line launches into a counterattack, and some of the men on the right side of his line do as well. One account states, Sumner gave the order for the whole line to advance together, and we did so at the double quick, charging with a bayonet and making a tremendous cheer. It was a great sight, dark with smoke, and we were all lit up from the fire of the guns and the line of bayonets we could see stretched as far as the eye could see. Another account from Henry Lyon of the 34th New York. He wrote, advancing forward with a bayonet is a sight that one will not be apt to forget in one's lifetime. We charged them in the mud that in places that was a half leg deep, we felt a total disregard for danger and our feelings of revenge toward our foe and converts a man into being a demon. Well, Henry Abbott of the 20th Massachusetts, he was a veteran of the disaster of Falls Bluff. He wrote to his parents on June the 5th, uh, when victory was achieved, you have no idea what a glorious feeling of victory brings. We were almost drunk with joy and so hoarse from cheering that we could hardly speak. Well, it is during this counterattack that Johnston actually receives that famous wound. He's down here uh, near the Fair Oaks Depot station, about 200 yards away from it. And he's struck by gunfire as well as an exploding artillery shell. And this the artillery shell that causes him the most severe of his wounds. He is down and he's placed in an ambulance and taken away uh, to Richmond to recover and he won't return to duty until November. Smith, as he's being coming out of the woods with his soldiers, he meets Davis and Lee on the Nine Mile Road, and that's where he finds out that Johnston has been wounded. And he is asked, first question from Davis's mouth is, what are your intentions to resume the attack tomorrow? If that doesn't sound like a hint that he, the, uh, Davis expected further attack, that certainly tells it but it is gonna be an impossible situation for Smith to live up to. But as you can see from the butcher's bill here, the Confederates lost over 1,339 men compared to 459 federal losses in a fight that was about three hours in the evening of uh, May 31 in the Fair Oaks sector. But remember, we're talking about contrasts in command. George Mindel, who was a staff officer during this battle and a Medal of Honor recipient, from the May 5th Williamsburg fight wrote, had Johnston's plan been fully executed as to time and place as contemplated, the left wing of McClellan's army would have sustained irreparable disaster and the retreat of the whole army would have followed. Think of the significance of what would have happened had McClellan lost outside the Confederate capital. Stonewall Jackson had just driven banks out of the valley in Winchester. He had placed Harper's Ferry in a state of turmoil. He placed Washington, D.C. and Abraham Lincoln 
and Edwin Stanton. The whole city was in turmoil over Jackson being at their doorstep. Imagine if at that same time, word had been received from the peninsula that McClellan had been defeated, and instead of on to Richmond, it's away from Richmond, it would have been incredible, the political impact alone. We'll just never know. Edward Alexander, he was a staff officer at this time on Johnston's staff. He wrote, Johnston's effort to handle the army in battle had been but an utter failure. His orders to concentrate 23 of his 27 brigades against McClellan's left wing, yet nowhere were ever more than four brigades in action at one time. That's very true. It was totally a mismanaged affair by Johnston and Longstreet. Sumner, once they, he drove the Confederates off that counterattack, Israel Richardson's division comes up and Sumner places his corps in a position on the right flank of the third and fourth corps that just defies anyone to try and attack. Him. So what he has done is in this little salient here, he's good at salience. The other one was an inverted salient. This is a regular salient. He places approximately 24 guns right in the point of this salient that'll control any movement on the nine mile road or any movement trying to come through these fields in this direction. He then stretches his division down in a position so that it just basically uh, flanks any attempts of a Confederate attack. Remember, Smith had expectations from Davis to launch an attack, but it's an impossible situation. And he wasn't even really aware of this, but pretty much think of this as being a shoe. And basically this is the tongue of the shoe and this is the toe. And basically, the Confederates are inside the shoe. They're in a, basically in a sock inside of that shoe. This is the sole of the shoe, and here they are. They really have no place to go. But yet, orders are orders. And the next morning, uh, the orders are given, and, and the advance of George Pickett and Louis Armistead advance into the Second Corps, <laughs> uh, which would be also something they would do a year from now. But but at any rate, Armistead and Pickett advancing towards fighting the Second Corps. Uh, Armistead's men are driven off in a, in a barrage that just drives them from the field quickly, and he folds backward. However, Billy Mahone advances his brigade, and he puts up a strong defense in the field. So strong is back that Oliver Otis Howard moves his brigade into the center and then down facing Mahone's men. And if you notice, Here's Oliver Otis Howard pictured with two arms folded. Uh, well, because at 10 o'clock that morning, his right elbow is going to be shattered by a gunshot. And by five o'clock that evening, his arm will be amputated at the Adams Farmhouse. So here's the final tally of the Battle of Seven Pines and Fair Oak. 11,168 casualties. Seven weeks prior to this at Shiloh, 23,000 casualties in 23 hours of fighting. Fair Oaks, Seven Pines, 11,000 casualties, 11 hours of fighting. These two battles clearly gave the signal to every homestead in America, North and South, this was gonna be a long and costly war. Yes, the sectors, the casualties in the Seven Pines sector were much higher, but it was the Fair Oaks sector that stabilized the day. And as you can see, the casualties of June the 1st were significant, even though that fighting lasted for a total of four hours. Here's a sketch. The reason I'm showing this to you, it's a sketch done at the time that shows the Adams house and only the barn itself, not the rest of the outbuildings that were here and have accounts of. But it shows these large trees that surrounded the house. And it's important because after the battle, we have this one famous photograph, or not famous, but it's a photograph from the 34th New York Regimental. It shows those very same trees in the sketch around the house. Well, today, there's only one tree left. This is two different seasons, but there's, there's numerous little holes in the ground of where sunken portions of the ground where the rest of these trees were. But there is, I believe, a witness tree that remains there. And uh, the house itself that stands there today is not the wartime house. It's not a historic house. The house at some point was torn down in a more modern house, but probably at the turn of the century shortly thereafter, 
was built in the, in the 19th century into the 20th century. Um, and as you can see here, this is a more modern development from the side. This is where I believe the witness tree is. Uh, this barn is not a barn that was associated with the battle. And it, Sumner actually arrived where you see this pine tree. There was a lane that entered in from this area. So when Couch and Abercrombie were in this area here and they looked back across this field, this is the direction that Sumner would have been arriving from. It's up here where Kirby's guns would have been located and Abercrombie's line would have run in that direction. The 82nd New York and the 34th New York would have been in line going off of this, of, off of this photograph. The 62nd uh, New York and the 15th Massachusetts would have been in this area. Our good friend, Chaplain Neal, would have been somewhere up here. And the 20th Massachusetts and the 7th Michigan would have been watch, walking to their positions on the flank of the 34th New York right on down this field, right in front of you. On June the 20th, uh, I'm sorry, yes, it was June the 20th this year, uh, the Battlefield Trust uh, and the owner of the property uh, got together and purchased uh, this property. So it is preserved forever. The owner sold the property, it's 12 acres. It is the only uh, battlefield land that has been preserved in either Seven Pines or Fair Oaks. And really, it was partially due to the research that I did on this book and that, that helped move this along. That, that's something, believe it or not, I'm more proud of than, than writing a book. Our friend, Dr. Chaplin Neal, would have been somewhere in front of the house. This is not the historic house, but he would have been somewhere in front of this house. And this is the leftmost position of one of Kirby's guns, approximately 100 miles, 100, 100 yards from the house is where he located it. So somewhere in this area would have been Gorman, Sumner, Neal, and others observing. So my friends, I thank you for your time. Uh, you see my book, The Contrasts in Command, The Battle of Fair Oaks. Uh, you have my contact information there. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. I know I went over a little bit in time, but I hope you found it to be productive and have an interesting conversation. And I'm open now to taking any of your questions. And I thank you for your attention.